This episode of the Wedding Film School Show is brought to you by Musicbed, the best music licensing platform for wedding filmmakers. Head over to themusicbed.com and enter our code WFS on checkout to get a free month on your annual wedding subscription. Now, on to the show. I haven't heard this a lot, which is like kind of the dark side of destination. And the reality is like feeling disheveled, coming back, your gear's all over the place, you're all over the place, you know, weather was inclement and just completely ruined this experience you were talking on the phone with your couple with for a year before that. A lot of people getting into the industry, they look at what you do, they look at your Instagram, they're like, that is what I gravitate towards. If I'm on a trip, I'm bringing my camera, I'm like, what if I was able to do this work professionally, travel, like, dude, it's the life. A lot of people think that you can scale and continue increasing pricing and doing all these things in the same way with like a local market or maybe like a luxury kind of market. Um, I think that at a certain point, you hit a wall in a way. It's where I would say 2% of leads that I get, I end up booking. I think there's a misconception that people make. Like, okay, I want to start shooting weddings. And then they kind of almost develop this uh, almost like a pride in a way of like, ooh, I'm starting to shoot all over the place. Bam. They just like hike their prices up to $10,000, $12,000, $15,000 starting price. And then it's crazy. Crickets. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Wedding Film School Show. My name is Jared. I'm here again, joined with Jason McCutcheon, friend, business partner, overall nice dude. How we doing, Jay? I'm not nice, but I, I would say, <laughs> so this is what I would say about you, Jay, is you are nice. In a, in a deeper sense, right? You might be a little bit of a cactus, but I'm, the juice on the inside is sweet. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I try to be a good person more than a nice person. That's the most important to me. Fair. Um, and so anyway, you know, we have a guest today, Stanton Giles from Films by Stanton. And um, he's known, I think, for a lot of different things, um, obviously being a good filmmaker. Um, and then, of course, a lot of destination. He has a course, all these different things. But I was thinking about like, all the weddings we shot, how little destination we've done. Now, I feel like compared to some people, like we've done a lot, you know, we've been all around the world doing wedding films, but relative to the amount that we book, like what up with that? What? And <laughs> and usually when we come back from a destination film, we're <laughs> yeah. like disheveled, a little bit wide-eyed, scared, I'm like shaking. Like, we're like, why would we ever do that again? That was so hard. I and always think like that was supposed to be so good and it was so <laughs> mediocre. I thought I was going to spend time at, at my Coba <laughs> on the you know beach yeah, by the pool, hanging out, have my Gucci sunglasses on and be a destination wedding and filmmaker. The, and the, it was the, so or, hard. And then the <laughs> resort took my drone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, do you remember that wedding we did in Dominican where – we were like, yeah, we have a Dominican wedding. And really, we just actually used it to go on vacation. Yeah. But regardless, like, we, <laughs> we shoot this wedding. And then, like, like, in America, right, we're so used to, like, oh, there's a golf cart for the bride. Yeah. That is not the culture in the Dominican. <laughs> and it's pouring rain. And That's, the yeah, that having, was a thing. The bride's having to walk, like, a mile across this resort. It, it was just, like... I, it wasn't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. That's what I'll say. Yeah. The hard rock at Punta Cana is not the most romantic <laughs> no, setting for a No, it's not the wedding. most high end. L let's introduce Stan. Stan, how are we doing, man? We're doing good. Enjoying enjoying <laughs> watching you guys banter <laughs> about uh, many of the woes of destination weddings. That's oh. uh, those, those aren't just uh, anomalies you guys are dealing with, I feel like. that's uh, I'm laughing because uh, I've have been there and probably will be there more in the future. Yes, yes. So, um, Stanton, why don't you like tell everybody in case they're not familiar with who you are, what you do, and, and a little bit about um, your films. Yeah, um, I'm Stanton Giles, uh, based here in Denver, Colorado, United States. Um, I am a travel wedding videographer. Um, that's my combination of the destination wedding and the elopement world. Um, but even at the same time, traveling and shooting... <laughs> This is my camera I shoot with, by the way. And I don't know yeah. why. This I'm just fiddling with this camera. Oh, dude, back I have to fiddle. On these disposable cameras. I, I love these little things. They're yeah, awesome. they're fun. It's also out of film, so it's got the little. Oh my yeah, gosh! Do you remember when you were a kid and you'd find one in your mom's mm -hmm. house and just keep going on with that thing? Just keep going. Yeah, it's still in my veins. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, but even you know, traveling and shooting normal weddings, whether it's in Napa or um, if it's in Alabama, I have one in January. That's just seven. You know, a barn in in Alabama is a nice kind of higher end wedding, but, um, you know, 
kind of there in the in the Appalachian Mountains there in Alabama. I don't know if there's Appalachian Mountains, but it's pretty venue. Foothills or so, whatever. Yeah. Something like that. It's pretty there um, and a different kind of pretty than like the Rockies. But um, yeah, traveling wedding videographer, um, always typically getting on a plane. I would say 90, 95% of the time to go and shoot a wedding. That's why having Denver International right here is um, is great. Also a big reason why I made the jump to move out here because within a year and a half of being a full-time wedding videographer, I was like, I don't need to be in Tennessee anymore. I can be wherever I want. And flying out of Memphis is a layover guaranteed basically anywhere <laughs> that I go other than Atlanta, Denver, and Cancun. Um, and so... Um, yeah, that's kind of how everything got going. Um, full time doing it now. Um, yeah, I'm shooting less for a few years. There it was 25, 30 destination weddings a year, which was um, soul sucking. And uh, now I'm like less than ten um, travel weddings and weddings in general a year. Um, doing more education. Uh, my films are um, kind of a combination of two different things. Probably like epic romantic um, or. Um, this like crazy Tulum party kind of vibe or something along those lines. Uh, I like to kind of pride myself in having, uh, you know, having a shooting style, but then being able to transform that in the editing suite and make it whatever it might be, whether they're having call of duty vows and, you know, I'm cutting in uh, live streams of them streaming on Twitch um, into their vows and just making the most of that unique kind of story that they have or party in Tulum or Epic volcano elopement, whatever kind of, uh, interesting detail i'm gonna like really chip away at that block to get deeper into it to try just to flesh out that story as much and so i'm not gonna sit here and get cheesy talking about story but definitely try to um get there, into that stuff no so, such anyway. thing no such thing story is everything that's what i've learned yes. from wedding filmmakers stand to that are, are the the rumors about the denver international airport true that's the real question mm. i want to ask you mm-hmm. <laughs> well um, today is a, is it, it's a Tuesday. So the Illuminati is not knocking at the door today to remind us not to tell people. So I can probably okay. tell you today that, <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> that there are, there are the, uh, well, it's funny because actually, obviously I don't The real reason you moved out there. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I see your cloak there in the are, background. There's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, uh, construction going on right now. Uh, and there's all these obviously conspiracy theories with Denver. And so like it's near baggage claim. There'll be all these signs going over the construction things and Denver International Airport's playing into it now and it'll be like are we working on construction or are we building a new <laughs> alien hub <laughs> like a picture of an alien there awesome <laughs> and so it's it's pretty funny just yeah. Beyonce yeah just <laughs> <laughs> they're totally yeah. playing into that I saw a video and they were like they would play the X-Files music in the background when they would just like be like over here this is where we you know baggage claim is and then there's like a spooky person like leaning out and then they'll just cut to the next scene <laughs> it's awesome. yeah dude yeah mm-hmm. then we got this big blue horse that's like 30 feet tall yeah yeah that's right outside of the airport with big red glowing eyes we call yeah. it big blue i think i forget i think that's the name of it uh lucifer lucifer that's what we call it nice, um, nice. the blue lucifer horse but um but yeah, apparently that thing fell over. The person that made it, it fell over on their first attempt to uh, erect it. And oh, good. And it fell on the person that made it. Did it kill yeah. them? Yeah. yeah. Maybe their Rumor spirit has inhabits it. it. Hopefully. There's Hopefully a lot. So. There's a lot. Anyway, well, that's there's, this, your, there's your and, Denver tea. And yeah. this is what this podcast is about. Yeah. If the Denver listening. International <laughs> Airport. We could do a whole podcast about We it. might get into wedding filmmaking yeah. or we might just. <laughs> so. Either way. So Stanton, we were talking like in like show prep about just kind of like, I mean, I'll just say it. I know with you guys that are doing education, uh, a lot of times you get asked the same questions <laughs> over and over and over yeah. again on podcasts, which makes sense, right? You have a specialty, but, um, but I figured we should not just talk about the same how to book um, destination weddings. And if you're interested in that, there are plenty of ways you can learn. Of course, join Stan's group. You can take a course by Stan. You can just Google follow it. him on YouTube and go listen to <laughs> yeah. the other 18 podcasts he was on. In this episode, I figured we'd <laughs> go into a different episode, kind of a different direction because I haven't heard it. this a lot, which is like kind of the dark side of destination. Mm-hmm. And maybe like Maybe not the dark side, because the last thing I want to do is convince someone, hey, not to follow their dreams or not to do the thing that the opportunity that that they're best at, that Mm -hmm. they're passionate about. But I do think whatever you choose to do in wedding filmmaking, there's going to be a bunch of there's the positives and there's going to be some negatives and you should go in eyes open. Right, Stanton? Yeah. Yeah. 
you should be aware of the fact that when you get to the other side of the fence where that green grass is, is that um, actually you're looking back at some green grass that was on the side of the fence that you just jumped over from. Um, and I think um, the grass is always greener mentality is something that I, I've really latched onto when I do talk about kind of this. I think it's fine. I talk about the dark side of it because I think honestly, there is a dark side to to most things, and maybe dark side might not be. That's the, the best clickbait word. side. That's the clickbait. That's what you should call this episode. That the dark is side what we're going to call it. <laughs> uh, nice, uh, but you know, maybe it's the um, the reality of yeah. shooting destination yeah, weddings. Yeah. The reality of travel wedding videography, and the reality is like a lot of what you're talking about. It's like feeling disheveled coming back. Your gear's all over the place. You're all over the place. Um, maybe you lost some gear. Maybe, um, you know, weather was inclement and just completely ruined this experience. You were talking on the phone with your couple with for a year before that and an expectation has been set. Now you're dealing with that in the editing suite. Um, there's lots of different things that I guess we can get into, but yeah, I like that's a, I mean, I'm happy to talk about that because um, as much as I will always advocate for people to at least try it, if there's like a little, tingle in your soul um that's telling you hey you know what this seems cool and odds are that most people have felt that i mean like i mean talk about the pros of it you're like what you said you're basically getting a vacation paid for if you want to sculpt it that way i mean back in the early days i would book a week on either side of going to norway or austria or italy or whatever it was or, or mexico just to enjoy the experience because great my way to travel the world it, it really is it is it really and, and we have a a desire to go and do that i think in our modern day and age and you know, right. looking back hundreds of years uh, that wasn't really part of normal life you know it was just the voyagers that would do that but i dude i can fly from 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 denver to iceland in five hours 45 minutes which is insane that's like just like my favorite possible place on the earth is iceland and it's so cool that i can do that it's like at our fingertips and so yeah. everybody's got that i think not everybody but i would say most people could you could probably venture to say you've wanted to do travel to some extent so being able to get paid to do that i mean like that's pretty cool that that seems illustrious that seems uh that seems awesome and so yeah that's the cool side of it but then there's always going to be a give and take because uh, i mean it's just part of being human and the human experience there's always something that is less than perfect with whatever it might be even if you're looking at living on a beach you everybody's like i want to retire and live on a beach you know whenever i turn 65 that is going to get boring as hell you know, within a, like a year or two. I don't think that people really want that uh, or they, they can really want that, but they get there and they're like, ah, really wish that I would have, you know, kept up with my community and kept investing into, you know, my, my work and my passion and doing certain things with life instead of just dropping off and drinking margaritas on the beach. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of like, why don't we just like, obviously we're going to talk about this, but like you, you found destination work as like primarily, did you just kind of, like happen to shoot because we were talking in an episode recently about like it was actually about NDAs and we were talking about like hey you don't you want to be careful with NDAs because you never know that one wedding film that's going to change your life right you drop a film and it just opens up everything for you and and good thing you didn't have an NDA right and and so like I don't know if that's your journey but like for you as a wedding filmmaker kind of like how did you kind of arrive at your current like demographic ideal client style of filmmaking mm -hmm. like how did you become stanton destination guy yeah um i was an engineer beforehand i think i mentioned um but you know before we're talking about this uh, chief tenant of engineering is problem solving engineering is a broad field but at the core of it you're figuring out solutions to problems and i remember my engineering professor always telling me that and it stuck with me and it's fun to look back at that because you know went to school for four years did two years of full-time engineering, ended up moving to an orphanage in Honduras. And I lived there for like 10 months. I quit engineering because I was like, this is, if I, if I got anything on my side, it's like uh, having heart checks inside of like, is this right for me? And also realizing that time is moving. And if I, if my, that the future is soon going to become my present. And if I don't start changing the present by taking action and then, then the future will be my present. It, hopefully that makes sense. So that actually, um, to me, I thought I was saying that. That's how much I relate with that. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, so anyway, with that thought in mind, I was like, you know, sold. I had owned a duplex back back then. I was like 24. I, I sold the duplex. I was like, I'm getting rid of this life that I, I know I don't want to retire at 65 uh, an engineer. I know that's not going to be fulfilling for me. I quit, moved to an orphanage in Honduras, stumbled upon a guy named Sam Colder. You guys might have heard of him. He's a big travel wedding videographer. 
he's the reason I got into video because he showed it was cool to me. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. I always thought of video as this flu foo kind of thing. And I'm not a flu foo kind of guy. Um, and so it resonated with me when I saw his work, but was moving to an orphanage didn't have a lot of money, came back, needed money, became an engineer again. But I started shooting video in that time. My friend asked me to shoot his wedding, West Tennessee, you know, barn weddings, nothing crazy going on out there. Um, typical story, shooting a friend's wedding scales from there, you know, taking on weddings for free or for close to free. You just, you start getting a lot of weddings, quit engineering. Once I had enough contracts to be able to live off of, I, you know, I was paying $350 in rent to a roommate at that time. I didn't have a lot of overhead. Um, and then that's when I had another heart check and another realization that, you know, time was moving those two things I talked about that I feel, you know, not that it's rare, but I feel blessed to have, um, is the awareness of time moving and being able to have the self-awareness to check where I'm at in life. And I was like, I don't, (laughs) I was like, I don't want to be sucked into doing this, uh, for the next five to 10 years. I want to do something that I feel passionate about. And I saw Sam's videos and I traveled a lot when I went to Honduras and went to Guatemala, Belize, Costa Rica. But I always knew that there was like more of a intact uh, in line places to go. And so Iceland was a place I'd never been before. And so I booked a trip there. Um, Ended up finding a couple, um, did their wedding for free there. Long story, um, much shorter. And from there, I like to call it a beautiful butterfly effect of just seeing, um, seeing the fruition of input and action. Um, just kind of like, uh, talking about like, uh, what's the phrase it's from the artist way. It talks about, um, it's like basically not to be hippy dippy cause I'm not hippy dippy, but like putting out this net and the fish just jump into it. It's like putting this net out into the universe of like, you know, just willing something into existence. And sometimes it just happens, you know, and again, that sounds hippy. That's not really my vibe, but, um, but from there, um, I realized that's what I, I wanted to do. I love shooting those kind of things and the butterfly effect of shooting in Tulum and Yosemite and glacier. And I mean, like ba- most really cool spots other than Canada, you know, I've, you know, been able to go to, um, and, and shoot these big name places. And so that's what I, that's what I really enjoy doing and, and going and doing these days. And the, the transformation of my business has been cool to see because it's been seeing, you know, let's say, I don't want to, you know, I know you guys are like big business minded people. Oh, and I love like bragging. Big... Please brag. <laughs> no, I know. It's just like, it, it seems redundant almost to say, but it's like, here's, uh, here's my heart. Here's where my life is. And like, hopefully as life continues going on, these two can be running in tandem together. Well, I would say like like Stanton, like a lot of people think that business is all about putting business first, but sustainable business is about doing something that you're not ashamed of repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you are not proud of what you're doing, you're not going to be able to do it every single week. And so Mm -hmm. you're a human being first, like we, you know, obviously business is important, but like, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do anything I'm ashamed of. Yeah. I like that. And everything I do is I I have to be proud of it. I, and I think like what makes you feel fulfilled, what makes you now given, I think a lot of people discount money because money is fulfilling. It is an emotional impact to having ease and freedom and not having to be stressed all the time. Those are emotional. Those are not yeah. like, it's not just look at this, like good luck living off of the beautiful pictures that you take, like with right. no money. Right. So, so that yes. being said, um, I think kind of as much as I, I find this a lot, Stanton is, um, when I talk to people like you who have very different outcomes than we do. It all comes from the same exact mentality. Nice. Like you can arrive at a lot of different destinations, destination, um, from, oh. a, but, but you, you can't, there's actually not a ton of motivations. Mm. The motivations are much more finite than the ways you could take them. It's like, like you, there's only so many ways a human being can be fulfilled and you okay. need to be fulfilled. You need to. Yeah. So I think like, it's really cool that you were like, I think every journey needs to start with a self self discovery and self assessment. I think not disco- discovery makes it feel like you're going to like do a bunch of peyote and that's how you're going to arrive at every conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's a great word for it though. Honestly, I think, but it's like discovery is like more like an actual adventure where you're exploring yourself going through hardship. Yeah. Right. And like um, I'm talking about, like, I think people should, I, I, I hate that I'm speaking um, like an authority on this book or something. I'm only like two chapters into it, but um, sick two chapters though. 
the the artist way uh by julia cameron or julie cameron i, for, I don't forget her name but it talks about like finding your inner creativity and, and i like it because i think that there is this ability to learn and, and be creative within all of us but at the same time there's this line that i highlight i've been highlighting i'm almost out of the highlighter two chapters in but it says sometimes finding yourself in your inner creativity is more like eavesdropping than like building a nuclear bomb yeah. meaning like that there is a lot of um there's a lot of fruition and progress that from this discovery, this searching within you, because I think that there is something, you know, that does drive each of us um, and listening to it um, instead of just trying to like figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, trying to like will it through this logical um, action step, you know, building a nuclear bomb. Like I was just saying in that analogy, like sometimes it's there inside of you and the discovery part is important. It is important. Um, so yeah. you kind of became who you are and now you're known for destination work primarily, but I think good work more than that. So, um, mm, thank you. Cause I kind of look at, I'm like, eh, who cares where you shot it? It just needs to be good. Like, um, and yeah. so, but I think most people who are like following you on an education side, um, probably are like, I want to do destination, right? That's important yeah. to them. And so you, you kind yeah. of have those conversations a lot, probably right with people. What mm -hmm. do you think like the number one, misconception a lot of the people who are kind of wanting to get into destination especially people who haven't done much um have about destination weddings a misconception i think uh i think it, and we could talk more about this i feel like it probably is a good lane for it to go down um a lot of people i think think that you can scale and continue increasing pricing and doing all these things in the same way with elopements and destination weddings that you can with like a local market or maybe like a luxury kind of market. Um, I think that at a certain point, and I'm kind of in this point, um, there, there, there is a, you hit a wall in a way to where I would say 2% of leads that I get, I end up booking or something along those lines. Like I get a lot of leads. A lot of people want me to shoot their weddings, but at this point, I'm my soul's been sucked dried by by getting on a plane and flying to shoot another elopement in Glacier National Park. It's actually taking away from Glacier National Park at this point because I've shot there so many times. I want Glacier National Park to stay special to me and not become this thing that I'm banging my head against the wall doing every time I come back into the editing suite. And so um based off of obligation. And and so I think there's a uh I guess kind of losing my train of thought there. Um there's there's this misconception that you can kind of like just keep, you know. Yeah, I, I think people think that I'm just consistently booking these like, you know, 20, 30 weddings a year. And my whole portfolio is all these these Iceland elopements and they're paying fifteen, twenty thousand dollars each time. It's hard for me to find somebody that wants to pay that much. They're out there. And those people I was talking about this on the last podcast I did. There are those people out there that that are like, I just want video. I don't even care about photography. I am in on having this experience that we're about to plan for for and chafe away from our parents' desires and do. I'm in to capture this thing and show how epic it is. You show how epic it is. So I want you there. What's the price? There are those people. The majority of those people are are not out there. The, the, the majority of those people are a different type of people. Those people that are um, going and shooting elopement, or sorry, that are wanting to have elopements, at least one of the reasons that they're doing it is uh, because they're budget conscious. It's much cheaper, you know, going right. and doing a, an elopement somewhere. And so... I think there's a misconception um, and a error that people make um, in in getting into this field that it's like, okay, I want to start shooting weddings. And then they kind of almost develop this, uh, this not arrogancy, but like almost like a pride in a way of like, ooh, I'm starting to shoot all over the place. Like I'm getting really good kind of a thing. And then bam, they just like hike their prices up to $10,000, $12,000, $15,000 starting price. And then it's crickets. And then they're not shooting weddings anymore. Well, they don't um, understand. I think a lot of people don't under actually understand how wedding, the wedding industry works and how budgets work too. It's like, like I, I was telling you on the phone, like I was like, who's more likely to give you $10,000? Someone spending a quarter million on their wedding or someone spending $40,000 on their wedding? Like that, it just makes total sense when you put it that way, but people don't think of it that way. They're thinking like, well, this is how good my work is. Mm -hmm. Look how good I am. And you're like, yeah, yeah, true. You're amazing. You're great. But you're, yeah. you're, you're working with someone who they don't have the money. Yeah. And I mean, it's like a, like to make an efficient, a fishing analogy here. It's like, if you have this huge pond or this huge lake 
and you're like the best fisherman in the world or something like that. And you're really good and you got all the gear and you can cast right and you can make that thing look realistic um, underneath the water. But there's not infinite amount of big fish out there. There's a lot of small fish. Um, so you're only standing in one part of the side of uh, like a uh, shore of the lake in one particular place. Like I think of like Flathead Lake in Montana, this thing's 26 miles long. Uh, it's, you know, the biggest lake that's West in the Mississippi river, that's freshwater. Um, and like, if you're trying to catch this, um, this 50 pound lake trout off the shore, it's not, you're probably not going to do it. And you're gonna be like, well, what's wrong with, with me? Well, you're, you know. It's uh, it, it, I guess the analogy kind of starts to break down a little bit, but there's only so many big fish out there, and it's a huge, uh, it's a huge pond in my opinion. And I think there are a lot of leads, but they're not always. You have to also think about how well known you are, searchability wise, and also referral wise for these people yeah. to find you. And I think that even, I mean, even for myself, I'm not, I, I have not, I am not the most perfect business owner in the world. I have been the subject currently could be the subject. I mean, this is all just, you know, um, a, a, an experiment as we go through and figure out what works, what doesn't work of, of my own mistakes, you know, of trying to figure out the best way to go about things. And I've been, you know, a product of that as well, where things have gotten slower before and I'll put starting prices, 15 K or something like that. It's like crickets on the website. I'm like, all right, let's just take that off a second and do a little bit of a, you know, charismatic uh kind of prowess over a zoom call and show them that it's worth the investment right, uh beyond right. just this wedding film you know and so like obviously like, i'm just saying that to kind of bring things down to like you know i've been there too and i've made mistakes as well that's yeah. so interesting because i just think a lot of people getting into the industry they look at what you do they look at your instagram they're like that is what i gravitate towards because most of mm -hmm. us if we're creative like if i'm on a trip i'm bringing my camera i'm like what if i was able to do this work professionally travel like dude it's the life right um mm. initially so people that are breaking into the industry they're like i want to do that um but then as you slowly get into it you realize like hey uh it's hard to find these people even just like i think for basic budgets it seems a little bit difficult to find um and then if you really want to charge a lot or enough um at the end of the day jay and i always say this if you want to be able to charge stanton prices you have to be better than Stanton and good luck. <laughs> good luck becoming better than, than yeah, what Stanton Yeah, I mean, clearly can someone can, by the way. Sure. And there, and I don't want to discourage anyone yeah, from like, doing there it. There are different styles than Stanton, but in general, I think the biggest issue I've had with the destination, not the educators or the filmmakers who are successful, but the people who think they want to do it, is they never are keeping in mind that they are competing they are competing with the biggest fish for the smallest budget yeah. for the smallest audience. Mm. It's yeah. It's all the best filmmakers, not all, but many of the best filmmakers who are like the most aspirational that people want to imitate the smallest budgets, typically not always, but often like relative, like I can roll out of bed and shoot a quarter million dollar wedding Stanton. Like that's, yeah. that's my bread and butter is high budget weddings. Like, and they don't even ask me price. They just half the time they'll give me $10,000 and I don't even speak to the couple one time. Yeah. Like that's how yeah. easy it is. And then in certain markets versus the destination where it's like, they want to like be your best friend. They're going to spend three days with you. There's a lot mm -hmm. of like, it's a totally lot of hoops you have to jump yeah. through. And I think right. they don't understand how much work needs to go into these things not just the shooting side the sales side the relationship side the experience side right they want that film and they want that experience of going and doing that destination stuff but i don't think they really <laughs> want to do what it takes yeah yeah well jumping back to what you're saying a second ago i i think there's a piece of the cake um to also offer up encouragement to people i don't yeah. want people to be discouraged Same. you know to, to be truthfully, at, to, uh, but I'm also being truthful. I'm not just trying to sugarcoat things, um, sticking in line with the cake analogy. But, um, you know, I think there is a piece of this this um, pool of, let's call them leads that, that you can get or people that are wanting to go and, and um, elope that if they are in the know, then they know that let's objectively speaking, like, you know, I create really good elopement wedding films. They, they will know that because they're in that space and they have a good budget. Well, 
if you compare my work to those that are in my course right now, my work is much better. You know, it's much better than theirs and they're going to hire me. And that's why I'm having a problem sometimes with this referral group that I have because people are reaching out to me and then I'm like, I'm not available. Or would you be interested in me finding you another videographer? And then I, they're like, yes. And then I post the date and stuff in there. I have six or seven videographers. I go through and look at their websites and I'm like, yo, dude, like this is what I'm teaching on in the course. Like you got to get this branding up. You got to change that banner. And like, this is not going to affect them in the same way that mine is. And again, yeah. mine's not perfect, but it is objectively, there is a vast expanse between it at the same time. I'm not Nike. I'm not Chick-fil-A. I'm not a uh, Rolex in the way that maybe if you know who I am, I might be this well-known house, like this household name kind of a thing. But most people don't know who I am that are getting married. I'm booking less than 10 weddings a year. How many people are getting are eloping out there? I'm not taking any more than that a year. Right. I don't have the bandwidth for that. And I've realized that's not where I want to go with my life. Yeah. Um, and so like, I think that there are people like my, my, it was just such a random happenstance that I booked my epic volcano elopement couple. They live in Kansas City and they had an Icelandic wedding videographer booked before COVID and they had to cancel because of COVID. They were going to get married in the whole rainforest. We're looking for an American based videographer. They just happened to stumble across, at, uh, I think they typed in like they were looking for a Mexico wedding videographer, like somebody that, you know, because they knew that it was popular to travel to Mexico. They found my work, was going to get married in the whole rainforest. Iceland opened back up. And then we went to Iceland, shot there. And so it's just like these stories are kind of random how they work out. But I also want to encourage people that like, okay, if you think that you're swimming in the pond of big fish um, that that are and you're a small fish and maybe your films don't, you know, let's just say uh, objectively speaking, aren't to the same um, level cinematic nature or quality of mind that you can definitely go and and find these couples too. And the awesome part about what we do, you do in the industry is if you're wanting to break into it. You can do this for free. Like people will jump at that if you're wanting yeah, to get yeah. into it. That's what I was gonna say, Stan. Is I think the opposite is most of what people think the journey is. It's actually most optimal for most people. Most people, in my opinion, could use destination at the low end of their pricing when they're first starting out to build their brand in a way that creates intrigue. Um, yeah. And then maybe they transition to some higher paying gigs, whatever it is. Maybe they stay in that lane. Who knows? but everyone is going to respond to a beautiful film in a beautiful place. Mm. Right? Like if you like if you shoot something beautiful, that's what your product is. And and, yeah. and so it's like I think it's the money of course is at the end of the day important. It's a business you're running. Um and and so thinking about like how you're trying to create marketing and interest in your brand, I think destinations as much as they're very different between sculpting with time and Stan Giles, mm. like, right. They're both destination. You know, one of them is right. Ray Roman's destination and the other one's elopement style destination. Both are, it's all like building this interest in these brands and whatever you're trying to do. And, and, and so I think destination people aren't wrong. It's an incredibly attractive, great for marketing, awesome and for some of you it's going to be your calling it's going to be the thing you end up being the best at but i do think everyone should try destination i really do like yeah at least a couple like i really do i don't know mm -hmm. if you agree with that stan but no i do and that's like what i just kind of like my thing is like give it a shot because there is probably something whether it's the free vacation or the getting to see these epic locations or you know getting out of the house whatever your reason might be um getting paid to travel at the same time. Like uh, there is always, I think you should try it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of fulfillment. I think built into the fabric of being a human, there is a desire to be around beautiful things. We're all attracted to sunsets. Um, we all love the sound of waves. Typically. I don't know anybody that hates the sound of a wave. Maybe they're neutral on it, but they definitely don't hate it. You know, um, that's Jason's actually a really you. weird thing to think about. Someone who hates waves. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's like hating breathing or hating water or something. Now there are people allergic to water, hopefully not oxygen. That'd be weird. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, um, I think I fleshed that thought out. Yeah. Yeah. I, Stan, I think one of the things that I just have so much respect for you and, and other kind of destination and probably more like elopement wedding filmmakers is that I really see you guys as like pioneers, man. Like what you guys are doing is so different than the traditional wedding market, which mm. is well established and like, hey, you're going to have a 300 person wedding. This is it. You're going to hire a videographer like you have this lane that's just naturally built into that style wedding. 
what you're doing is like totally different. It's a totally mm -hmm. kind of new approach to shooting weddings. Um, so naturally with that, like it's going to be hard. <laughs> so you're not going to naturally yeah. have probably like the $50,000, you know, gig, Dude. uh, mm -hmm. or whatever. But what you're doing is you are an advertisement for the elopement industry, uh, for wedding filmmakers. And you're providing people examples of like, Hey, like a lot more people would probably gravitate towards an elopement just in general because they saw an elopement film and what you're doing. And so like, I, that's one thing about I, that I just it's love about the industry. It's very new age weddings. It really yeah. is. It's like this. I mean, I'm not sure that most it will ever be true that most people get elopements. I think probably not. Right. But, but you um, never know. I mean, you, people are getting more people probably will. less people are getting married now because weddings are just so expensive. So what's the alternative? Like, I think yeah, that how do there's you, a like, huge how do you share opportunity. it with your family still. How do you invite people into the experience right. again? Right. Dude. Yeah. They always say that on the phone. Not always, but I would say one of the biggest things I hear is like wanting to be able to share it with the people that couldn't make it because one, like I talked about one of the things people reason people do elopements because of budget. And so it can be hard raising your prices, but two, you get a lot of your family's opinion out of the way and you can do right. it the way you want. Um, and so that's a really cool side of it as well. So yeah, no, there's definitely, even like with COVID, um, I saw a big uptick in the amount of bookings I got for micro weddings, you know, in, in Utah or, uh, you know, up in Montana, people are enjoying that. I think that when they see these films, they're seeing the accessibility, um, you know, and that, Hey, uh, you know, Shelby went and did this. She's my neighbor. She's a teacher down the road. I can do this too. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. have to be this. I mean, she looks like a fairy princess goddess standing on the crashing wave shore of Iceland with the you know, Inspire flying around her. But you can have this all for the price of 10000 you know, whatever it might be. Uh, you, you can make these people into little movie stars. And that's the fun part is kind of like inviting people into this experience in a way and showing it in the way that they dreamed it would look like. Well, it's like the people we're shooting for, right? we're shooting one group of people who typically our audience is like, you know, wealthy families who the parents are paying and that's the culture of their family. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what the bride wants and that's what the groom wants and that's what the parents want and that's what the family want. And that's how you, they're being brought in is through this party yeah. that they're throwing. Just like there are different films and different, like there are different people who are booking wedding films and booking getting married in general have different experiences. And so I think it's really cool that everyone has an opportunity. That's part of what you got to learn too. Right. Jared is like you as a wedding filmmaker need to learn how to communicate with an audience mm -hmm. and how to tell people's story, a lot of different types of people's story. And probably at one point you're going to realize like I'm best at this type of storytelling. Maybe you get bored with that and you change it later, but yep. but I think initially is like gravitating towards that. Stan, you said yeah. um, you said something interesting, and I think it's worth kind of bringing up to to a lot of people because a lot of people listening are probably like, "Hey, this is kind of what I want to do um, is is get mm -hmm. into this. How do I even kind of start?" And you mentioned something interesting that you shot your first um, wedding film for free. Um, I know there's a lot of like destination people out there who kind of like poo poo the people who, you know, will shoot destination work for free. Um, how, how do you kind of, you know, juxtapose that? Do you feel like it hurts the, the wedding film world when people are shooting mm -hmm. these destinations for free? Well, what's your kind of take yeah. on that? Yeah, no, I actually, I like that question. That's a great yeah. question. Um, and something that like some podcasts would even be scared to explore. Um, I, I think it's necessary. Um, I remember I was listening and this, I'm not gonna say this near as eloquently or as cuss word written as Gary V. Um, but he, he had this thing that he was talking about, you know, he always talks, he's a big proponent of breaking into a new industry and doing stuff for free because how are you qualified to shoot this kind of wedding, uh, based off your current portfolio? Because I would venture to say that a wedding videographer with barn portfolio stuff in West Tennessee that doesn't have anything else in their arsenal to show is not a travel wedding videographer, nor are you qualified to be doing it because it is way the frick different than, than shooting in Iceland and flying a drone around and the weather and having enough batteries on your actual person. And like, I mean, those are simple examples, but all the other things that logistically go into, into doing this and telling the story in a fluid manner. Now, obviously they are very analogous and they're very related and, you know, 
shooting a wedding there. You're still going to shoot them getting, you know, saying vows and all this kind of stuff. You put together the film completely different though. And you shoot it a lot differently at the same time. Um, and so to those that, um, yeah, I mean, every now and again, when I'm looking in Facebook groups or on Instagram, there'll be those that'll comment and say things about like being worried about, uh, like we just as an industry need to raise our prices and stuff. And that might be all good and true, but most of the people that are getting married that, that let's say, there's this pool of people like me that are starting off or see a really good opportunity that are wanting to do things for free. Those people's budget is never going to change based off of the rising tide of an industry standard going up. Ugh. They only Tell had $1,000 no matter what. They d- d- You can't just force somebody to pay you $10,000 because they might just have a $1,000 budget. And the whole reason that they're going and eloping is to save money. And so... um I don't think it's affecting the industry and also the turnover rate of, of weddings as far as, you know, we're, I mean, humans are constantly getting to the age where they're going to get married. Like you will always continue to find people. Now I'm sure there is an argument that goes for the other direction. And I'm sure that argument is valid, but at the same time, man, like if you, for, for one, there are so few people that I tell exactly how to book destination wedding. And I know it can be a little bit scummy and some people don't like it and, and whatnot, but I'm like, look, I promise you, that if you take two weeks and you send five emails a day and just offer your services for free, I guarantee you, you'll have something within two weeks. And I'll message them four days later and they got busy with life and they didn't do anything about it because people are you, uh, don't understand the power of action and actually doing things. Um, but those people are out there. And again, I kind of, you know, I know people have different thoughts on that approach as well because that can seem spammy and it's kind of the same idea as us getting hassled by, you know, wedding ed- or like you know like the low-end dmu wedding ed- editors and stuff like that for wedding films we just book just all our like... stuff in bride facebook groups personally so <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but uh but yeah so um i think that i think that there I, I think there's a lot of good in doing it for free but also at the same time almost like in a juxtaposition kind of a thought um and i'll, I'll end with this um people want to get into the wedding industry or into the travel wedding industry but they don't understand that one, sometimes like people don't want to pay for your services because they don't see you. The perception is that you aren't qualified. Um, but then uh, they don't want to put aside money for like five seconds. They don't want to like, they don't want to put aside money to build this portfolio and this brand um, that that they find illustrious and that they they think that their, their direction in life is heading. And so it's like, I've had people before message me and I've done mentor sessions. They're like, dude, I had this like super sick three day thing in Cancun and Um, They only wanted to offer me $500 for pay plus paying for my travel. And I just can't like, I couldn't do that. And I was like, I was a little like, you know, you know, I was like, obviously every situation is different. I was like, well, like, are you, you know, needing to fill that with like, you know, another wedding to be able to pay for your bills and pay for your family and things like that? They're like, uh, they were like, no, like we were pretty set with like, we're kind of reached our max bookings for the year with everything. And I'm like, then at that point, I actually lean in. I'm like, dude, I'm like, what? I was like, what are you doing? Why are you letting money affect you when every one, you're not qualified to be doing it. And you have this opportunity that we're even freaking paying you to go and, and fly across the world and shoot their wedding. And you have this portfolio piece for three days and, and you're worried about money on this one. As some people just get blinded by it in the yeah. beginning. And then on the back end, when you get into it, they get blinded on the back end because they think they're too good and they raise their prices. Now they're not booking anything. So it's like this like, there's this there's this happy space I think sometimes and like you know really getting into the destination wedding world does that idea translate? Oh my it's God, exactly yeah. so I was at an event the other day and a guy who worked at one of the top hotels in Boston was there and I was telling him that I am working on something with the hotel mm. and he was like don't he used to work there and he goes don't do anything for free for them. He's like, they're going to do blah, blah. They're going to promise you all these referrals, blah, blah. And I was like, I'm not doing anything for free. He's like, I w- he's like, well, I'll, and I was like, I got invited to their planner event. I'm the mm-hmm. only filmmaker at their planner event. Trust me. I'm not stupid. I don't do nothing for free. If I do it for, if I do it for free, it's because I know I'll make a ton more money off the opportunity than, and like everybody in the industry, whether it be destination or what Jared and I do, Jared and I do a, we have shot four styled shoots this year. For very specific reasons, for very specific partners, one of them got picked up Ramona by Ramona Cavaza, um, which is like like everything we do. Like anyone who's doing anything in this industry at any high level is actually giving a ton of things away. Every person, mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. they're, they're they're making their pricing choices yeah. based on how good the opportunity is. They're like I would. I was talking before and I said like if I got a phone call and like I know some people this is old hat because they shoot this but if they were like oh Corbin Gherkin shooting this wedding I'd be like sure whatever hmm. whatever it takes I'm going to go because I know what that relationship means long term and maybe she hates me and never wants to work with me again yeah but, but maybe she loves that. me I mean, yeah. and that's what I'm same same with me I'm taking on less weddings I don't think I'm going to be a wedding videographer forever I think it's been an incredible you know, piece of my story. I'm, I had a wedding booked in August of this year and I all of a sudden just got this, like, I keep talking about this heart cry. I'm like, I, I got to do something that's different. I know I love landscapes going back to that, that initial prick in my heart of like, I want to shoot a wedding up in Iceland. I've only been traveling down to Costa Rica and Belize and all that stuff. I want to start shooting in Iceland and do weddings with that. Well, now I'm like, let's maybe take the weddings out of the equation for a minute. And there was this Greenland voyage going in August. And I wrote this freaking novel to this guy um at basically long story short being like hey can i here's here's my wedding work i know it's just weddings but could you imagine this on the sailboat voyage to greenland for 10 days and like uh i can't pay for it um and i i i'm booked for a wedding on the days but i will cancel that wedding fifteen thousand dollar wedding um in washington and i will come do this because i know that one it's going to be worth it and it's going to be like oh my God, like the the stuff that's going to come from this trip. Like they posted something. It's called the Laid Back Company. Is the oh, I've um, seen them. It, They're awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, dude. You should look at the video they posted today. I'm like, why are you hiring me? That video is <laughs> epic. <laughs> but uh, but like same. Like even to this day, I mean, like even in the wedding world, there was like this well known photographer named Asha Bailey, and she's you know big on Instagram and stuff. And I was like, I took her wedding in Italy for three or four days with her family in Puglia and uh, Positano and you know, Malfi coast for $6,000, you know, uh, plus travel, which to me, I was like, that's a massive low ball at this point, but it was worth it. I gained 1500 followers from a shout out from her, you know, and you know, I don't know what the further fruition of that has been, but I think being aware, like if you can't, if you can't take opportunities and stride and actually like make the most of them and put money to the side, even though it's important, like you're saying, Jason, like, uh, I, I don't know if success is on the horizon in the way that you're hoping it will be. Cause I mean, I, it's not just this linear graph where you grow no. like this. It's, it's, you know, up, down, down, you're going to get a 15 K you're going to get a $6,000 Puglia wedding. You're going to get a 22 K wedding in the Bahamas. You're going to, and I'm saying like actual parts of my curve and you know, I might book a $7,000, you know, Glacier National Park elopement. Cause I want to go home and see my parents in September before I go to Italy for something. And so it's like, what's your life look like? Yeah. Well, and what you do you want to look like? You just never, most people don't throw enough things at the wall. Hmm. They try one mm. thing. They try two things. It's like you have to try 20 things. Mm. Maybe two of them work out. Yeah. Yeah. Like 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 this idea of like success being a foregone conclusion if your work is good. Or if it's yeah. it's it's not true. It, it, there's so much complicated stuff, but anyway, yeah. like mm-hmm. I think another important thing for the kind of younger filmmakers out there that are getting started and and maybe they've had some work like pride will always plateau your career. Like if you're not willing to eventually be like, Hey, I know that I'm not going to get paid as much as I would get paid on this other gig. Um, but I think it's worth it, uh, to take less money and, and do the kind of work that I want to do. It's just going to plateau your career. I've seen it in, in people that are working for us. They're like not hungry anymore. They think their shit don't stank. Like they're like this great filmmaker. They're the people that make the most mistakes. Same thing with this. Like you have to just be still hungry, like go after these opportunities. And like, if you're like, oh yeah, it's a great opportunity, but if they're not going to pay the bills, they're not my ideal client, they're not whatever your excuse might be. But usually it's, they're not going to pay my rate. It's disrespectful. Like, you know, who knows? Like be willing to maybe take that opportunity. I think is a, is great advice, man. That's awesome. Yeah and, yeah, and 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 I hope what you if you listen to this episode, in many ways, Stanton Giles couldn't be any more different than Stop Go Love. Mm. But when you actually break down how each of us have arrived, they're very, very similar. Mm. And, and 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 like just know like at the core of any successful filmmaker is this like like a certain ethos about what they get to do 
and how they get to do it and how they want to be living their lives and how they would it's and like of course like the output is what you see you see oh i see this film by by uh alex douglas or stanton and like I, I, that's cool i want to make films that look like that and i want to make that much money those are just results there's a book that really changed my life called four disciplines of execution and it talks about lead measures versus lag, lag measures and most people are only measuring lag measurements which are things that lag behind intention and and those are finished films and money those are lag mm -hmm. measures. Those are not what successful people measure. Successful people measure intention. They measure effort. They measure satisfaction. These are the things that you should be measuring. And, and if you do those correctly, at the end of the day, you're going to end up. And of course, like we're kind of passing over this, guys. You got to be a good filmmaker. Of course. Mm -hmm. You got to be good. Right. right. You got to be good. But, but assuming you're good. A lot of good people aren't as successful as they should be. I think that, that's fair. That's the truth. And so, Stan, very much appreciate your mind, appreciate your heart, and obviously appreciate Same your films. Same to you guys. Um, would love to. Um, how can people find you, get connected more with with what you're doing? I'm uh, pretty active on Instagram, so just films by Stanton, S-T-A-N-T-O-N. Um, I run the Destination Wedding Elopement Videographer Facebook group. There's not – I mean – a ton going on in that group to be honest it's i'm just a dude trying to do 18 different things in life by myself and so that's one of the things that kind of falls behind but it's there for people to post in for you know help or questions and sometimes i'll get in there and do polls and just stimulate you know conversation and activity around destination weddings and elopements and so um that's a good place youtube stanton giles g-i-l-e-s um and yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of where i'm out and about i'm here in denver colorado if you want to grab coffee sometime yeah, we were there. We were actually in Denver. We shot a wedding there last August. Nice. Well, it was nice actually in, at, uh, in Snowmass, but regardless, that was our foray yeah. into destination last year. I there love we Denver, go. man. Dude, <laughs> if we didn't have so much spot. going on over here, I would be in Denver or Boulder or somewhere out there. Just the snow man, is too good a, and the vibes are good. <laughs> the vibes are good. Yeah. yeah. That's, a yeah. Great, that's accurate. Yes. Yeah, so I had excellent food while we were there. So. Yeah. Yeah, same, same. Close Thank to you. everything. Sometimes too. people come in here and they like dog the food. <laughs> like, For real? Uh, yeah, they're yeah. like, oh, it's this big city, and you think it's gonna have all this good food, but it doesn't. And I'm like, you just didn't know where to go. And I'm like, that's that's naive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know how to use the internet, so <laughs> I'm able to. Some find, don't. I was able Some to find don't. restaurants. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but really appreciate having you on. And if you like our show, uh, it means a lot to us if you would like, subscribe, all that stuff. Um, we are it. on YouTube. If you want to watch this, most people don't. Most people want to listen. So if you are listening, that is awesome too. I would just ask, please leave us a five-star review. You know, we are, we don't have a course to sell. We don't do, we're just, we love wedding filmmaking. We love the industry. We, we just, we're generally passionate about it. And if you appreciate that, the our, all we would ask of you is just, hey, let someone else know. That means a lot to us. So thank you so much for checking out the Wedding nice. Film School show. And um, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye, guys.